Look who's on the stage with us today. Wow. I don't need to say any more about his bio. We have a living legend in our midst. And if you don't know today, today is a day in history that we will never forget because we're going to be transformed, changed, and impacted, and we will not leave here the same way we came in. <laughs> and that's because we have in the house the visionary and courageous leader, our dear sister, Dr. Helen V. Griffith. So kind. I'm telling the truth, telling the truth. <laughs> so kind. So let's just talk a little bit about how you got where you are. Yeah. How was your schooling experience? I heard some things about last night. We'll get to that later. Yeah. But tell us about your schooling experience and how original and unique and how it shaped you into who you are today. Ooh, well, I appreciate the question, though. Would you say I was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma and stayed for a couple of weeks? Oh, <laughs> long time. No, no, that's right. It was quick. It was quick. And then went to Topeka, Kansas. My brother was part of Brown v. Board of Education. His girlfriend, Linda, was a major person. Wow. And his girlfriend was six years old. He was six, so they had an early kindergarten thing going. I see. <laughs> and, but it ended up in Sacramento, California. So I'm a Californian to the core. Go and, Cali. Oh, yeah. Sacto, Sacto. Inferiority complex towards San Francisco, Oakland, East Bay. But that's all right. We working it out. But I, I, I've, of course, had the most blessed of, uh, of childhoods in terms of being the son of Irene and Clifton West. I'll never be the human beings that they are, ever. My mother, first grade teacher, principal, school named after her now, Irene B. West, right outside of Sacramento. Amazing. See? Isn't that something? That's something. But Legacy. I brought a lot of tears in their eyes because I had a lot of rage. And I love to read, but at the same time, I, I didn't have a channel for my rage. And so I got kicked out of school when what? I was in third grade. Yeah, for two months, I got kicked out of school when I, when I had to fight with my teacher. You I heard know? about that. We were talking about that. Brother Nelson. I know Brother Nelson's here somewhere, too. Where is he? There he is. We talk, last night, we had such a good time. But, yeah, see, my, my, my great-great-uncle had fought in World War I, and he came back in his military uniform, and he was lynched in Texas. And so I associated in my mind as a young brother the flag and the lynching. And so I refused to salute the flag, you see. Early Kaepernick. Well, well that's true. Right. That's true. You he didn't stand at the time. Of the and old brother Eminem's took a knee the other day. Right. I appreciated that when the other folk, those great artists, didn't take a knee with him. But the important thing is that the association of the flag has a variety of different manifestations of people associate the flag with people who loved ones died in the war that flag means something very powerful and they got a right to have deep allegiance to that flag but the important point was that being so blessed and having so much love come my way so even when i did not have access to school i was still able to get a lot of work done and uh, uh, and when i did get a chance to go back Earl Warren Elementary School, uh, I took advantage of it. So let's, so let's just go back a little bit for the audience. He actually refused to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance because of his experience with his uncle, a flag draped in lynching and injustice. Mm, mm. And that shaped you to be the man you are today. Oh, absolutely. So looking back at that experience, I just want to let the audience know some, something else that um, he's not very proud of. He, he hit the teacher uh, uh, because she hit him and he hit her back, but he said today, you wouldn't do that again. No, I was wrong. No, I was wrong. I was wrong. I, I, I was impulsive. And uh, young folks, don't ever hit your teachers now. You see, you don't imitate everything about somebody. Important point. A very important point. But I know in your own family, though, you've had some... Uh, yes, we've had challenges. Challenges and struggles with various kinds of attacks and assaults. Right. Was that right? Born in Mississippi. Oh, yes. I was there for six long weeks and <laughs> uh, then come back to California. But my family, I'm a third generation educator. So my mother and my grandmother were both teachers in the Deep South. Wow. And they talked about the inability to read and write because it was illegal 
for Against my great grandparents to learn to read and write. So by the heat of the night and candlelight, they struggled and they taught themselves to read and write because they knew the value of education. Absolutely. And so it was imparted to us. And that's why we do the work that we do to impart to them the value of an education because it Absolutely. cannot be taken away from you. And it is the key to power. And it's the key to transformation. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? And I've heard Ooh. stories too, Dr. West, about my Ooh. grandmothers who, whose brother was carried away by the Knight Riders at 14. They never saw him again. Mm. And they had to live mm. through that trauma and still walk in Mississippi in fear, but also knowing that there was going to be a better way and education and love and forgiveness was a part of that story. Mm. See, the beautiful thing, especially for the students, when you look at our dear sister, the executive director, the trauma that has come her way and you, she chooses to be a wounded healer rather than a wounded herder. My hunch is if you all were to t examine closely her own works and witness, you would know that that kind of hatred's coming her way because she's a love warrior. Absolutely. You wouldn't know that kind of tear in the family because she's a freedom fighter, the freedom to not just read and write and think for yourself, but the freedom to cooperate with others in order to be part of movements bigger than you that leaves the world better than you found it. See, that's what education is all about. The connection of the love of truth, the love of beauty, the love of goodness. And I'm a revolutionary Christian, so I still have a love of the holy. You see? And that has to do with living a certain kind of life of service to the least of these. And that's what this grand institution is about, right? The percentage of first generation. Very high. 100% of the Prairie Scholars are first generation It's 100%. Scholars. 100%. They'll be the first in their families to graduate from college. And Dr. West, yeah, let's give it up for oh, all the first serious. gen in the that's house. Serious. All the first gen in the house. That's serious. You can walk into a sixth grade class and ask them, why did you choose Prairie? Sixth grade, tenure. They say, because I can do something my parents never got to do. I want to make my parents proud. I want to change my family. I want to change the world. So tell these scholars how they can go about changing the world based on your experience. What can they do at their age? Yes. Well, the first thing you want to do, let me just look directly at them. Maybe I need to stand up and get closer. The first thing you want to do is to believe in yourself. Have confidence in yourself. To respect yourself. And to understand you come from a family, a tradition, and a people who constitute greatness. And greatness is not the same as success. Not the same as success. Greatness has to do with discipline, cultivated talent, and being connected to something bigger than you so you don't get caught in your narcissistic ego. You don't get caught in your narcissistic predicament it opens you up that's what the love is talking that's what the love is about young folk you see and so when you are in that classroom at this blessed institution you say to yourself hmm believe in myself respect myself situate myself in a tradition bigger than me doing my homework with a smile even when it's difficult why? Because that's one of the skills necessary in order to be part of the tradition. But it's not just about the skill. It's about you being a certain kind of human being who's acquiring the skill. See, that's what greatness is. The difference between education and schooling. Schooling, gang access to the skill, get a dynamite job, feel good about yourself. Still too narcissistic. Still too hedonistic. Education, deeper. Using the schooling for some grand end and aim bigger than yourself. Healing others if you become doctors. Pursuing justice if you become a lawyer. Right? Making sure you get those rhymes and lyrics right if you're a poet or a professor. That's what we have in these students in the making you all understand what i'm talking about 
Does it make sense to you? If you do, just go ahead and applaud yourself that, that, right now. If it makes sense to you, that's exactly right because it becomes part of your own calling. Celebrate yourself. Definitely. Understand your genius. There's a doctrine out, a new book, uh, Cultivating Genius by mm. Goldie Muhammad. It talks about teaching to the genius of our students. Yes, and I imagine yes. that's what you do all the time. In your words, what does that mean to teach to the genius of a child as opposed to the deficits? Ooh, I like that. I like that. Yeah, too often when we look at highly vulnerable peoples, oppressed peoples, hated peoples, traumatized peoples, we can only keep track of their deficits. Because that's the gaze of too often the mainstream, you see. But in fact, as human beings full of creativity, and we ought to be acknowledging both their potential and possibility, but also, you see, their humanity that is a precondition of the potentiality and possibility, you see. And so when I think of young folk, I think of the genius. Now, what does genius mean? Let's be very clear about this because genius is not some romantic ideology of an isolated individual who comes and creates something unprecedented. No. Uh -uh. Genius means geniality, largeness of mind, largeness of soul, largeness of heart. And they all go together. They all go together. You see, that's why there's no such thing as an isolated individual. Ludwig Beethoven, isolated genius. What would Ludwig say? I don't exist without Haydn. I don't exist without Mozart. I don't exist without those musicians that I learned and imitated when I was young and tried to find my voice against their voice. Aretha Franklin, genius. I don't exist without Marion Williams. I don't exist without Rosetta Tharp. I don't exist without Gladys Knight. I don't exist. Stephen Sondheim, genius. I don't exist without Oscar Hammerstein the second. I don't exist without Leonard Bernstein. I don't exist without E. Barbara Streisand. A variety of voices. That largeness of heart, mind, and soul comes out of traditions of earlier persons. So when we think of each and every one of you, you don't exist without your precious mama. Let's give it up for mama. Yes, mama. Give it up for mama. You don't exist without your precious father, your grandparents, the people who cared for you, loved you, pushed you, unsettled you. You don't exist without those dynamite teachers and faculties at this grand institution. Give it up for the Absolutely. teachers and the faculty. Yes. You all know what I'm talking about. So that talks, that brings us back to your legacy. Your mother, there's a school named after her. How awesome is that? Yeah. My mother is a retired teacher from Mississippi. She entered Oceanside Unified School District in 1956, was the first black teacher to sign a contract, broke the color barrier. Amazing. Yeah, you can give it up for her. She's 88 years old. And, and still going. And still going. Oh, and still going. she got to be so proud of you. She, oh, thank you so much. I'm so proud of her. Really? But I share that because we want to hear more about your mother's legacy. My mother stepped into a school and the superintendent told her, what are you going to do when the children call you a nigger? Excuse mm. my French. Wow, Lord. And you Lord. know what she said? I won't answer to that because that's not my name. Ooh. So I just want to hear more about your mom and her legacy and what she left in you, because obviously you're standing on her shoulders oh, as we stand on all of our parents' shoulders. Isn't that just share truth? with us what she imparted to you and impacted to you that has caused you to be the giant you are today. Well, no, I'm not a giant. I'm limping along. <laughs> but uh, uh, I certainly believe that putting a smile on my mother's face when she was alive or from the grave uh, from the porch of heaven is the standard that I aspire to. And it's a standard that I can never fully reach. I can only approximate. And therefore, I don't have a language for mom. Wow. If I could sing like Luther Vandross, I'd sing a song. Or if I could play the piano like Art Tatum, I'd play some piano. But as T.S. Eliot says, it's a raid on the ineffable. You see, it's that reality is so deep and profound that any kind of language will fall short. 
And so all I could do is try to live a life that would put a smile on her face. And she was a love warrior of the highest. There we go. The high, not no shoes, AKA two. Oh, whoop, whoop. Ooh, there it is, there it is. We go <laughs> six, oh, six, oh, six, oh, six. It's a little fraternity sorority thing up here though, y'all, yes, but yes. it has to do with the richness of the black tradition that in the face of all of that hatred, here come a love supreme. Yes. In the face of all of that tear, here come the Ida B. Wells Barnetts and the Sojourner Trues, the Fannie Lou Hamers and the Martin Luther King Juniors. Those are not just names in a pantheon. Those are human beings in the face of the most evil forces steal out of their spiritual and moral sense of the world are able to dish out the best, not just of black people, not just of America, but of the human spirit as a whole. And that's why it's very important. And I know you get this at this school under your leadership, you see, to talk about what's at the center of it. What does it mean to be human? Big question. Human. Absolutely. And that word coming from the Latin humando, burial, that we are linguistically conscious beings on the way to burial who bury our dead in order to connect us with those who are gone. You see? and then to decide what kind of persons. And so education is simply one of the means by which we, the formation of attention, attend to the things that matter and try to not be distracted by distractions given a culture of a weapon, which is in many ways weapons of mass distraction. To stay on the surface with the superficial things rather than what really matters, integrity, honesty, decency, generosity, the things that will be said at your funeral when they won't read your curriculum vitae, but they won't know what kind of human being you were. How deep was your love? Yes, How yes. deep was your courage? How deep was your generosity? That's what goes on at this grand institution. of That's awesome. You talk about bigness. You talk about your love warrior, your love warrior mom. And that love, faith, hope, and trust are those things that are eternal. Talk about to our students, how can they build their capacity to love when they see injustice, when they see unfairness, when they see discrimination, when they see all injustices and people not creating equal, being created equal. How can they build their capacity to use the most powerful weapon, which is love? at this age, at this stage, to make a difference? Absolutely. Well, one is that, you see, there's an intimate connection between loving human beings. And there is a whole lot of love at Preuss. Is that right? Yes. Is there a lot of love at Preuss? A lot of love at Preuss. That's crucial. Because when you love people, you hate the fact that any of them are being treated unfairly. When you love fellow students, you hate the fact that any of them are being treated unjustly, and you hate the fact that they're not fulfilling their potential. That's why you encourage one another. Oh, Brother John, I know that you could have done well. You could have done better than that. I have great confidence in you. The next exam, we're going to spend a little time together. You're going to hit a home run. Uh-huh, because I hate the fact that Brother John is not doing what he ought to do. Oh, Sister Letitia, we know how brilliant you are. You walk around satisfied with a B plus, and you are A plus student. Yes. What's going on, as Marvin Gaye would say? What's going on? So that this love is not an abstract thing. It has to do with how you engage in action on the ground. Let's talk a little bit more about that power. Yeah. And the power of separation. You talked about it last night. To not hate those who are the victimizers and to separate them 
to hate what they do, but love them and how that works and how we manage that and how we can make the separation of, I don't hate you, but I hate the behavior. And then what do we do with that? Well, I'm knowing you, you and I come out of the same tradition, right? The great tradition of black folk in the face of 244 years of the most barbaric slavery, still holding hands in a ring shout. It was against the law for black people to learn how to read and write then. But to raise their voices, the power of orality, the power of spirituality and created the spirituals. And those spirituals will be heard down through the quarters of time. Same is true after Civil War, 200,000 black men leave the plantation so, so the economy cannot operate any longer in the South and they join the Union Army and break the back of the Confederacy. And then 12 years later, the withdrawal of the military troops White supremacy wins the peace even though the Union Army won the war. And another 100 years. Now they call it in the textbook segregation, but don't believe that deodorized, sanitized, sterilized language. We keep it funky. <laughs> it was terrorism, American terrorism against black people. But every two and a half days for 50 years, there was some black child, a black man, a black woman hanging from some lynching tree. That's part of American history. And in the face of that kind of barbarism, here comes Ida B. Wells. Here comes Marcus Garvey. Here comes Martin Luther King Jr. What is it about these people in the face of this kind of terrorism to still lift up love and to tell their children what I was told, what Dr. Griffiths was told, that you hate the sin and still try to love the sinner. You hate the oppression and the domination and you stay in contact with the humanity, even of the gangster, even of the thug. That's what Martin Luther King Jr. said when he had to give the eulogy of the four precious girls in 16th Street Baptist Church, blown up by cowardly white terrorists, blown up by the KKK. What do you say to the world, Martin? I come from a tradition of love warriors and freedom fighters that say that even in the face of this kind of barbarism, that we're not going to lose contact with the humanity of the terrorists. We're going to hate the sin, hate the terrorism, hate the injustice, but still try to hold our heads high and be able to have open possibility of solidarity with the folk who mistreated you. It's hard to find a people in the modern world it's time who for have applause. that kind of love. That's what's in the that's what's in the saxophone of John Coltrane's Love Supreme. That's what's in the song of love and the need of love by a genius from Saginaw, Michigan named Stevie Wonder. You can hear it in Aretha. You can see it in James Baldwin's essays. Love forces us to take off the mask. We know we cannot live within, but fear we cannot live without. Yes, and it comes all the way up. You can hear it in Mary J. I know she's the queen for the young folk, but I'm with Aretha. <laughs> oh, yes. You can hear it in the best of Beyonce, but I'm with Aretha. Well, that's our girl. That's our oh, girl. I know. I love them. I love them. But the question is, you got to keep that tradition going. You see it in Donny Hathaway. You see it in Luther Vandross. You see it in the Delphonics and the Dramatics and the Mighty Dales and so forth and so on. Those are not just entertainers. They're love warriors. They're teaching the world something about love, given what is coming at them which is hatred on every level and register. And young folk, that becomes a challenge to you. And of course, black folk have no monopoly on this. It's a human thing, isn't it? It's a thoroughly human thing. Bob Dylan's a Jewish brother. He's a blues man, vanilla blues man. Right. Why? Because he's on the love train too. Just listen to his music. Bruce Springsteen, blue collar, vanilla blues man. And we could bring it all the way up 
to the present. That's time for an applause right there. That's time for an applause. Because this, this thing that you're telling us to do, that you're challenging us to do is hard. It's a hard thing. You can't do it by yourself. Very difficult. It's a difficult thing. That's exactly right. To love someone who is not loving you back, right? Not only just not loving you back, but harming you in the process. And that probably wears on an individual. That's true. How do you keep your black joy? How do you keep yourself to, you know, nourished and your, your spirit flowing and the, the juice flowing and the fresh water? And how do you stay so young and handsome? Oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Good God Almighty. Well, my wife is smiling now, you see. You got my wife smiling. She's beautiful, things. too. Oh, indeed. Give it up for Anna. He did my wife here, though. Wow. She keeps me smiling. But no, I got so much joy in my tank that I could, I could go three lifetimes. Because when you come from the West family, you come out of Shiloh Baptist Church. If I could turn on John Coltrane and Aretha anytime I want. If I could have access to all of the riches of not just black America, but all around the world, that's enough love to keep me going. I just wish that it could have a larger impact on the world at large. That's the challenge, you see. That's the challenge. So in terms of myself, you know, I don't worry at all about uh, black joy and black love and so forth. Oh, no, not at all whatsoever. Very much so. I, uh, 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 I, I've been blessed to have an abundance of it. And if you met my mother, you understand exactly what I'm talking about. I couldn't get to the crack house if I wanted to. I see. That's a good thing. Absolutely. So it sounds like you were surrounded by love. Absolutely. Which we can actually find people to surround us with love. Oh, yes. Well, they got a lot of people surrounded by love at, 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 at Price. Is that right? And not just Preuss. I, don't, I, I know we got other high schools as well and other schools as well. I'm just kind of focused on Preuss since we're here, though. Well, that's okay because Preuss is everybody. So the focus now is going to be on the students. I'm going to ask a few questions Ooh, from now. Oh, indeed, indeed. Yeah. And this, was, uh, this is from uh, Eden. And they, they're asking you, were there any times when you wanted to give up? If so, why did you want to give up? And how did you push through? There's certainly moments would I want to give up because we're all human, that we're all human. Uh, um, you know, I've, I've been speaking for many, many decades now, and I've had a number of death threats. People have shown up and put a gun to my wife's head, and I've had folks standing in my driveway with shotguns, and I say to myself, I'm not thinking about giving up, but I've got to be concerned about the welfare of others, just not myself. See, so I had to think on it. I got to pray on it. I got to call my brother Clifton and work this thing through. See, there's nothing wrong with wrestling with despair. It's like the 32nd chapter of Genesis where Jacob is wrestling with the angel of death in the midnight hour and he emerges with a new name, Israel. Israel means God wrestler wounds but new energy new vision you see wrestling with despair Goethe, the great german poet used to say he or she who has never despaired has never lived because it's impossible to be human and to move from your mama's womb to tomb and not wrestle with despair when i stood in front of the coffin of my father of my mother I was overwhelmed. I should have been. That's human. That's human. I think about giving up. I said, what would they think? Would they want me to give up? I thought about it, but they want me. No, not at all. That love kicked in. That joy kicked in. That strength kicked in. That fortitude kicked in. That determination kicked in. And I emerged stronger than ever. See, mom just passed a few months ago. I could have gone into hibernation. But I come out like a spiritual Joe Frazier, Muhammad Ali, <laughs> yes. willing to swing and keep bearing witness to the degree to which I could be true to their standards. To their standards. And that's true for so many in this audience. I'm not alone in this regard. You've all wrestled with death. 
and dread and despair and disappointment and disillusionment and so on, you see. So that that's what I'd say to my dear sister. Does that make sense, my dear sister? Yes, all right, all right. Give it up, give it up for our sister here. <laughs> so give it, it up for the high quality questions coming out of this high quality school. So I love the fact that you really nailed that to the why. If you have a why for what you want to do, it yes. keeps you coming back. And also I see you as an athlete, you have exercised that muscle that makes you continue to get stronger with each challenge. Well, I thought I was going to be the next Willie May. Well, there you go. <laughs> then I thought I was going to be the next James Brown. Oh, my. That's a big one. So I failed on both accounts, <laughs> but I'm still trying to be true to myself. All right. So let's see if we can answer this one, because if you can answer this one, we are all going to settle and rest easy tonight. Is it possible to overcome white supremacy in a country built upon it? And that's from Anthony. I, I'm not one to believe that you can eliminate evil. I think you can push it back. I think we can make breakthroughs against it, you see. Uh, I'd say the same thing about patriarchy. I'd say the same thing about the hatred of Jews and the hatred of Arabs and the hatred of Muslims, the hatred of Palestinians and the hatred of Dalits and so forth. Can we ever eliminate that kind of evil, I don't think we can. I don't think we can. And if we proceed based on the fact that in the next few weeks or years, we're gonna eliminate white supremacy, you're gonna be profoundly disappointed. Profoundly disappointed. Right? Women have been hated and marginalized for thousands of years. Have we made breakthroughs against vicious forms of patriarchy? Absolutely, yes. Have we anywhere near? Have we come anywhere near dismantling patriarchy? Absolutely not. Right. Jews have been hated for three thousand years. They're still alive. Arabs, Muslims hated for centuries. Still alive. Gay brothers, lesbian sisters hated. Still alive. Non-binary hated. Still alive. Black folk, oh Lord have mercy. All you got to do is just turn on your television. You can see how cheap black life is to too many of our fellow citizens. Some of them policemen, some of them not. So it's not going to be a question of eliminating my brother. It's going to be a question of you and I choosing to be human beings of integrity, honesty, decency, generosity, moral consistency that says that we are in our own actions going to fight it no matter what. But because we, neither one of us are messiahs, we're not going to save anything or save anybody. We're just going to make it better. We're going to make it better. Yeah, that's time to clap. That's the commitment yeah, that's that the we time have. To clap. You see, that's the kind of commitment. Absolutely. So we can leave the world better than we found it. I, I figure That's like right. if there's nothing to get up and love on, then maybe there's no reason to get up. But if I get up with the, I'm gonna love somebody today, then I've got purpose. Ooh, that's true. It's gonna drive us every day to leave the person, the place, the thing better than we found them that day. And you see, the real challenge is that all of these evils that I'm talking about are deposited inside of us. So it's not just a matter of fighting the white supremacy over there. You can't grow up in America and not be shaped by white supremacy. Black people themselves have white supremacy inside of their own souls because we've been shaped by white supremacist civilization. So what I'm talking about is coming to terms with the civil war taking place on the battlefield of our own souls that are connected to the racisms and sexisms and xenophobias and class arrogance and imperial hubris right? that's in the structures and institutions. The individuals and the institutions, the human beings and the structures are intertwined because that's what we've been taught. And what education at its deepest level is, is like Socrates. We are going to question this. We're going to scrutinize this. You see. It's like Amos and Esther and Jesus and Muhammad, that we are going to go a way against the dominant ways of the world. The dominant ways of the world are hatred, greed, domination, oppression, subjugation. We're going to create interruptions of those tendencies in the name of love, justice, mercy, 
dot, dot, dot. How many lovers do we have out there? Can I hear all the lovers out there ready to interrupt? Re ready to ready, interrupt. Ready. ready to interrupt. That's ready. Yes. Now here's another Absolutely. really good question from Jasmine. How can black students today spread awareness to non-black students about micro and macro aggressions effectively? Mm. Mm. Wonderful question. The first thing is you always want to keep open the conversation. You don't want conversation stoppers. You want to make sure that people are open to listening. And how do you do that? You try to build trust. And you build trust through humility and fallibility. You say, well, you know, I don't, I know nobody has a monopoly on truth, but I got some things to say. I hope you're open. I'm going to listen to what you say, but I want you to listen to what I have to say. Let me tell you what it's like to be a beautiful, brilliant black woman in America, given what happens every day. A certain look, a certain grin. I'll say something, nobody will listen. Somebody else say the same thing. Ooh, that's such a brilliant formulation. Wait a minute, I've already said it. You rendered me invisible. You need to know that. I don't put up with that. I'm a self-loving, self-respecting black woman who comes from a great people. Say it with love, with a smile, but say it strongly too. Say it strongly too. You he sounds like you sound like you've been at the table in some of these conversations <laughs> with the sisters. Oh, whoever come to the table for me, absolutely. What are the benefits of diversity and leadership? Because I know we have our chief of diversity here from UC San Diego. We have major strategic initiatives at the university of which I attended. I'm an alum. Whoop, whoop, go try it. Yes. Right on. Seen many things. But what are some of the benefits? And maybe you can talk about some of the challenges of diversity and leadership and accomplishing that and achieving that. Diversity is inseparable from quality. Wow. Diversity increases the quality of the work done in any institution. Our black people's anthem is lift every voice. And you lift every voice because by lifting every voice and hearing people's perspectives, it broadens the lens through which you look at the world. And all of us look at the world through a set of lens that are shaped by our experiences. And if your experiences are narrow and you use those narrow experiences to define other people's experiences, you are cheating yourself because you are actually blind and don't even know it. And all of us have our blind spots. All of us have our splinter in the eyes, to use the language of Adorno and biblical scripture. You see. And so diversity simply says, let's ensure that we lift every voice so we can hear what our precious indigenous brothers and sisters got to say. Can you imagine what their view of America is from 1492 to the present a 400 year war against them and Americans run around telling the world we a beacon of liberty? No, you got to hear what indigenous brothers and sisters got to say. They've got their truth linked to their sufferings. You got to be broad enough, mature enough to embrace the best and the worst of your country. And so it is with the 1619 Project of black people. If you can't take the truth in terms of what it means to be enslaved for 244 years and 100 years under the US Constitution and deal with the American terrorism coming your way because that makes you offended, you got to be able to come to terms with the truth. It doesn't mean that America is only a terrorist state. It means there's been terrorism in the development of the country. And if you're unwilling to listen and learn, it means you're not serious about the truth in education. And in the end, as Brother Malcolm X reminds us, you're going to reap what you sow. Chickens come home to roost. The truths and the sufferings crush the earth will rise again. And you have to be equipped and ready when they do come home to roost. And that's true for every life, every nation, every empire, 
every every social regime. Awesome. That's awesome. Damon Williams said in his book on leadership, diversity and leadership, that our country will never realize its full potential unless everyone is represented at the table. Economically, financially, socially, emotionally, we will not realize our fullness until we realize diversity. So thank you for that question. And let's continue in that quest for diversity. Let's give it up for that answer. I love it. No, that, All the, right. the, question, the question is so wonderful. Malia is asking today, she says, have you always been outspoken about political and social issues or was it a skill you learned through experience? Mm. Have you always been this vocal? Was there a time when you held your peace and you didn't say anything or is this a skill that you learned through mm. experience? Well, I've always tried to be a jazz man in the life of the mind, which means I've got to have the right timing. You see, so I can't just speak it all the time. Just like we were saying last night when the young folk tell me to stay woke. No, I can't stay woke. I don't want to suffer from insomnia now. No, no, I got to time myself. I come out of the sixth chapter of Ephesians, put on the full armor. You got to be fortified. And when you're fortified, you got to have the right timing. When you're going to fight this particular skirmish, when this particular battle might be the pivotal one for the war and so forth. And so it's true that uh, going back to when I was six, seven years old, I was speaking out. But for me, you know, it's not just a matter of speaking out and it's not just a matter of speaking truth to power. A lot of people say, oh, Brother West, you speak truth to power. I say, you know, I just try to speak the truth because sometimes the relatively powerless need as much as the truth as anybody else. Absolutely. And when you speak the truth, it's always Janet's face. It cuts a lot of ways. It begins with yourself. When you speak the truth about yourself, that's painful. There is no truth that's not in some sense a challenge to yourself, to your people, to your community, to your nation, to the world. And that's why going back to that issue of, of love, I mean, even during the Obama years when I was very critical of Obama because I just couldn't stand those drones being dropped on those precious Pakistanis and Afghanistan folk or him bailing out Wall Street and not bailing out homeowners. You see, and they say, oh, how you so critical of a black man? You ought to be giving him a standing ovation. I said, I did give him a standing ovation for about two hours. I was break dancing in such a way I made MC Hammer look like a boy scout. Because black success is a beautiful thing, but black success is not black greatness. And greatness is a moral and spiritual criteria. And if you're not attending to the least of these, the poor, the elderly, the prisoners, that's Matthew 25, then a critique is to bear. Then they say, oh, you so critical of Obama, black folk gonna turn against you. I said, I don't love black folk in order for black people to love me back. I love black people because they're worthy of being loved. Yes. This is a matter of integrity. This is not popularity. Yes. Is it? Oh, you know, I travel with my dear brother, Robert George, you know, he's a conservative Republican brother. And I love him like a brother and our families are very close. Why are you traveling the country with a vanilla conservative Republican brother? You know, he's wrong about some things. I say he's wrong about a whole lot of things. <laughs> he's still my brother. That's going to make you unpopular. I'm not worried about popularity. I'm trying to be true to what mom and dad and the others at their best represented, which is the standards of integrity, honesty, and decency. So I can revel in his humanity and still point out how wrong he is on a whole host of issues of public policy. That's what it is to be human at the deepest level. And that's very important for the young folk. Don't just spend time and hang out with the people you agree with. Don't demonize people you disagree with. You be true to yourself, think for yourself, and allow overlap so that you always stay in contact with the humanity of the folk. You see, that's a challenge, but it's a beautiful thing to be part of because that's what it means to stay on the love train. To agree, to disagree. That's right. In love. Keep the conversation open Absolutely. so that we can make transformation. I love it. 
How can we dismantle male entitlement in the black community? You got to hit it head on. We brothers need to be pushed against the wall, rendered accountable, answerable, responsible, and then telling the stories of the past of even the great male figures. W.B. Du Bois, the great public intellectual of the 20th century, PhD Harvard, why did you push out Ida B. Wells Barnett when the NAACP was founded? You ought to be shaming yourself, even though we recognize your great contributions. Is it? Martin Luther King Jr., we understand that you didn't always treat the sisters the way you should, even given your greatness. We appreciate your greatness. We are going to render you accountable. And that's true right across the board, right across the board, so that in the present day, our sisters building on Audre Lorde and Bell Hooks, and Toni Morrison and Alice Walker and the whole host of waves of magnificent black women. You see, they become exemplars who, not out of envy or resentment, but out of their own sense of self respect and out of the welfare of the larger community, bring critique to bear on brothers who are too patriarchal, misogynistic, and so forth. So you don't, in other words, you don't put up with the male entitlement at all. Not at all. Indeed, and you know, the black tradition is the only tradition in the modern world where the major pathblazers and initiators were women. Poetry, Phyllis Wheatley, yes, and Plato in the essay. The greatest novelist, Toni Morrison. Greatest playwright, Lorraine Hansberry. The greatest first wave of blues singers, Ma Rainey, Bessie Smith, the greatest vocalist. And we got some serious black brothers of Nick, Nat King Coles and Johnny Hartman. But when it comes to Ella Fitzgerald and Sarah Vaughn and Billie Holiday and Dinah Washington and Carmen McRae, even the brothers got to sit down. <laughs> and we're talking about quality. We ain't talking about gender preference. We're talking about excellence. At the highest level, you see, Mahalia, Aretha, we, we can go on and on. What is it about these people whose black women constitute the exemplars of the highest levels of excellence? Anna Julia Cooper gets a 60, 67 years old writes the dissertation in French and gets a PhD from the Sorbonne as a principal of a high school just like this sixth grade to 12th grade high school here, the Preuss School, Anna Julia Cooper. What a cloud of witnesses. Not because, oh, they're women, oh, they're women, we so glad that they're women, no. They're the best. They did the best. They exemplified excellence. That's what we're talking about. That's the crucial thing. And they contribute to the larger community. They don't do it just to be isolated successes. They do it because they love something bigger than them, the children, the community, and they're connected to their past, and they authorize a different future. That's the key. I know my dear brother Kanye West the other day, you know, he said, we got to do away with black history. We just want Black Future Month. I said, my dear brother, who could be my cousin. <laughs> I said, don't you think that you can't talk about the future unless you connect it to the best of the past? Mm -hmm. You think you exist without your mama and grandmama and you think you exist without Tupac and Biggie and the greatest of them all, Rakim? Come on, Kanye. If your music, which is so profound, because he is an artistic genius, your music allows for the tradition to be heard, is working through it, and your voice is connected to the voices who came before, and every performance in the presence of great art authorizes a different future because it doesn't allow despair to have the last word. You see. 
And so the three dimensions of time, of past, present, and future are intertwined. So you can't talk about the future unless you're talking about the past and the best of the past operating in the present so that the present can lead toward a better future. All three of them intertwined. And I think he got the point. I, I think, think he got I, the point. I think, I think he got, got the point. Because yeah. I love the brother. He just confused about a whole <laughs> right, right, right. lot of things. And, and could be your cousin. Could, and could, could be, be my cousin. Because, you know, his cousin. people come from Oklahoma. Like right. mine, not a lot of black West. <laughs> That's a really good point. We, we have to embrace the past. To, to connect us to the future. We just had a door decorating contest at Preuss on Black History. Ooh, beautiful. And we had a phenomenon that I've never seen before. And it's going to relate to this question. But they had all kind of the past historic figures. And then, lo and behold, our vice principal got on the door. Her picture. Ooh, Ms. Nalika Faye Watson. Where is the vice Stand principal? Stand up, vice where principal. Where is she? Where is she? Where, there up. she is. There she is. And the is. scholar said we she... We salute you, my dear sister. She made the wall of, of wow, black history. A current beautiful. a current uh, uh, forerunner. Yes. And I was so impressed that our scholars honored her in that way and let her know. They said, Miss Watson, you are our black history. Mm. And so I just want to acknowledge her for that. But also I want to tie it in to this connection about... Your, you mentioned a lot of your role models and people who have influenced you, but what are some of your current day living legends that inspire you? Ooh, who are some of the present ones? Uh, uh, probably the greatest black intellectual who inspires me would be Farrah Jasmine Griffin. My wife and I talk about her all the time. She's a giant. She's the adopted daughter of Toni Morrison. She's written some of the most powerful texts on Toni Morrison. She wrote a book on Billie Holiday called If You Can't Be Free, Be a Mystery. It's unbelievable text. She wrote another text on John Coltrane and Miles Davis when they were working together. She wrote another text on what set you flowing because, of course, the most important movements of the last 50 years is the migrations and the refugees and the asylums of people who move from one country to another. My dear beloved wife comes out of Iran. All the way, she's pushed out of Iran, lucky to get out of Iran. They're trying to kill her and her family. I'm sure many of you come from different places. I, my dear brother Chancellor, you may have had people one or two generations away who made their way to America, is that right? Or How many generations is it? Yeah, just one generation. That's beautiful, you see. Part of this most fundamental process of migration, immigration across national boundaries and within national boundaries, you see. And the, the challenge becomes then, how do we ensure that we bring the best of our various traditions? Because keep in mind, when we talk about the past, the past got good and the bad. Right. You see, you're talking about roots. I'm going back to my roots. Which roots you going back to? Mm. Everybody got something in their roots that's thuggish and gangster-like. Everybody, every culture, every nation, every nation's got ties to domination, repression, whatever country it is. But you also got resistance and resilience in the face of it. If you go back to those roots, you see, then we can come together with the cross fertilizing of our, the best of our past together. And we had always hoped that that's true, not just for America, but for any nation, but for any nation. But it's always a challenge. Always a challenge. Always a challenge. Well, we're coming to the end here. So we're going to end with this last uh, charge here. Mm. And we want you to share with the youth what legacy do you want them to leave? We hear your legacy. We see the path that you're creating, but that baton pass to them. Charge them right now with what legacy you want them to leave in this world. Mm -hmm. Well, one is I want the young people to recognize that there's nobody like you in the history of the cosmos. And just like your fingerprint, you got a voice. You got a calling. You got a mission. You got something to do that nobody else in the world can do. 
And it's not just in terms of your education. It is terms of you being a human being who chooses to love. You can love your friends and love your parents in a way that nobody else can. You can build on the best of your history, which is distinct in terms of being manifest in unique, singular, irrepeatable you. So that means then that you're not going to run around imitating people. Ralph Waldo Emerson says imitation is suicide. Emulation is a sign of an adolescent mind. You're going to be yourself. There used to be a brother who played organ in my church, Shiloh Baptist Church. He's from Vallejo. We knew him as Sylvester, but he's known to the, to the world for the genius that he is. His name is Sly Stone. Mm. And he wrote a song called Thank You for Letting Me Be Myself. Be myself. Again. Again, and he, he did it in the funky mood. I know y'all was listening it's to very some funky. We love funky that. music, but Sly was funky. But he was saying something profound. There's a brother who lives right here in San Diego. He was there last night. His name is Sal. He just did a new album with Sly called Destiny. And he got all three of us, me and Sly and, 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 and Sal, on the, on the single, Destiny. Because Sly is a truth teller to you. Be yourself. There's only one self like you, and you having your self confidence and your self respect can build on the best of your roots and take it to a level I know not of. Because I'm an old brother, old school. There's no way I can understand things in your circumstances and conditions in the way that you do so you can build on whatever I've been about and take it to a place I know not of. Slide wrote another song called I Won't Take You Higher. You take it higher. More excellence, more vision, more love, more courage, Woo! more determination, yes. more style. Do it with style now because you got your own individual style. It didn't say swagger. I didn't say swagger, swagger is spectacle. Style comes from the depth of your soul to touch other souls. And I would say, you want to do it in a soulful way. And by soul, I'm not talking about just something that black people possess, even though we got a lot of it. <laughs> but soul is the sharing of a soothing sweetness to others against the backdrop of a catastrophic world. So it's being kind and gentle and sweet as well as involved in the quest for truth and beauty and goodness. And only you can do it in your way. That's the key. And I'm thoroughly convinced that the students that we're looking at here, not just at the one institution we've been hiring, but all the students here, I don't want to exclude some of the older folks, but all of us here, at our best, in our own unique ways, can, can, can be forces for good and even better forces for good, whatever faults and foibles that we have. So thank you all so very much. Let's give it up for our dear sister, the one and only visionary leader, Dr. Helen V. Griffith. <laughs> and Dr. Cornell West, you have dropped some wisdom and knowledge on us today. We'll never be the same, will we? We're going to go out and drop love.